Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to Energy Speaks Back, powered by B2B Energy. My name is Paul Webb, and I'm the founder of B2B Energy, and I'm your host, and weekly I present to you energy experts from around the world. Welcome to episode 158. Our purpose, as always, is to provide a good understanding of energy management knowledge from around the world, which is available today for us to deliver savings that impact on our planet. Welcome, energy enthusiasts, to another enlightening episode of Energy Speaks Back, where I delve deep into our guests' origin and their knowledge in the industry. Please engage with comments and the poll after this episode. Today we meet with an energy expert from the UK who I've known for over 30 years, when he was an energy manager of a large London-based property builder, owner and operator. Our guest today is retired and though he keeps up to date with sustainability and energy management, he's also very instrumental in the football world where he was the chairman of Sutton Football Club but is now the treasurer. So without any further ado, let's get stuck into the game and get that ball pushed into the net and meet with David Fairbrother. Good afternoon, David. How are you today? Hello, Paul. I'm fine, thank you. Nice to see you. And yourself. And we did actually meet recently at the conference, didn't we, at the ENCO conference, where we, we shocked ourselves into discussing when we first met and how many years ago. I think we've done the numbers of about 30 years. Um, it was a rough figure. Yeah, I think it's about met. that when uh, I was doing uh, training in controls and you work for a controls company and uh, without giving it away, but I think we probably met up down in Horsham, but also uh, when I was at work. So yeah, it's a long time ago, different world. Yeah. And I'm hoping today the industry hasn't changed. It just looks different. I think that's the best way of describing it as such. Um, and you've been throughout the industry. You're, you're a very well-known name in my books. And I'm very proud to be interviewing the, the smiles there. But I'm very glad to be interviewing you today. So thank you very much for joining us. I do. Yes. Been around a long time. So, David, I know you, obviously, for 30 years plus. Um, but for the benefit of our audience today, can you tell us about your background story and your origin story? How you got into this industry? Okay. Uh I fell into it. I guess like a lot of people, I did a degree with no real thought about what I was going to do as a job. And I did a degree in astrophysics. And when right. I came out uh, at the end of the 70s, I got a job working in education as a laboratory technician. Uh, but I should explain that one of my passions is football. And I was a lifelong supporter and still am of Sutton United Football Club. And at the time, uh, they were playing local football, Lismia League football around the southeast. So I could go to every game. Right. But the job I had was with Epsom College, which is a public school. And being a public school, they worked Saturday mornings. And then in 1986, Sutton did something very silly. They won the league and got promoted into what was then called the conference. And it's now the National League, which, as it implies, is games all over the country. And if I wanted to carry on watching every game, I needed a job that meant I didn't work Saturdays. Right. So I scanned the jobs pages of the Daily Telegraph and saw something for energy cost controller wanted with a firm I'd never heard of called Land Securities. Wow. And I thought, well, I'm a physicist. I understand energy. I'm good with numbers. I'll apply for that. I got an interview. Uh, I was the only candidate, apparently, who knew how to convert joules to kilowatt hours. So that got me the job. Wow. Uh, I went in. At the time, energy management wasn't really a thing for the property no, sector. it wasn't, was it? The property companies just paid the bills and passed them on to their tenants. Yeah. And the guy at Landsec that I reported to, a guy called Ron Naylor, was probably the first, well, he was the first energy manager in the sector. So I became the second. Uh, and his view was, if we can manage the costs according to good management principles, that keeps the cost down for our tenants. Therefore, they're more likely to renew their lease. So that's good for business. Yeah. So it was all cost driven. After a couple of years, the story started to come up about uh, fossil fuel shortages, which obviously have been around for donkey's years, but every now and again they peak, don't they? Yeah. And so we started to focus on reporting in terms of what we were saving in terms of fuel as well, the, the benefits other than cost. And Lantec were very good to me. They sent me on a degree course at South Bank to train in building services. So I, I got a master's in that. Uh, and Ron insisted I join the Central, Engine, Central London Energy Management Group, where he was secretary. 
I eventually took over him from a secretary and then became chairman of that group for 10 years. And that was really good. Lots of chats with people like you and other like minded people in all sorts of sectors about energy. We had some really good meetings. Uh, and I did that for about 10 years. I got to the point where, unfortunately, I could predict how much the energy bill was going to be for any particular building as it landed on my desk. Oh, Morgate Hall, that's going to be £70,000 this month, which was helpful in a way because you knew if it was wrong to check it immediately. Mm -hmm. why, why, why is it different? Why is it not what I expected? But also I thought I've been doing this too long. And around that time, investors were starting to get interested in the environmental issues for property. But the only issue they really understood was renewable timber. So is your timber coming from a source that is certified as renewable? So I got briefed by one of our directors to give him some information ahead of the AGM. And we did that for a couple of years. And then he was very far-sighted and came back to me and said, actually, I think environment's going to be really important over the next 10 years. Would you like to be the environment manager? Well, I actually asked my boss to be the environment manager and he ran a mile. So I got then asked, energy is part of environment. Will you do that? So I went from being the second energy manager in the sector to the first in-house environmental manager. Right. Again, Lance sent me on another course this time. Well, at, what uh, it? was that, David? So I started doing that 96, 97. Wow. So if you look at the other property companies, Hammerson and British Land, they were probably four or five years after us. Yeah. Uh, 2000, I think, we produced the first environmental report that actually quantified our carbon footprint. Uh, and we, we actually went further than other companies then did when they – put their reports out because we included the energy that the tenants were using right we're saying well we're not responsible for that and our argument was well actually we designed the building we run the building so we sort of are responsible in a way mm -hmm. which predated the idea of uh scope three right. which of course is the bane of everybody's lives nowadays how do you calculate scope three so i'd like to think we, we were sort of ahead of our time on that i gave up the energy management role on a day-to-day -day basis but still kept my hand in doing it for some of the properties. So at one point I was buying energy for a hundred shopping centers and offices and retail parks up and down the country doing their energy management. We got to a stage where I pre pre uh, Excel using a system called framework where actually we'd set it up with a little basic routine. Then you just press a button, go to lunch. When you came back, a hundred reports all printed out all degree day normalized. It was great. Um, we could feed in the, uh, the, the degree day data from the trend systems and things like that. So it was all quite, quite good. Um, and then I took over, as I say, looking at wider sustainability, so building sustainability into, into uh, buildings that we were developing, uh, doing environmental impact assessments up front. So was it, were we going to face any unexpected challenges? So one day I got a call at uh, 11 in the morning saying, we're looking at buying this site in Kent. Uh, can you uh, look into it and see if there's anything unexpected? Yeah, well, how long have I got? Two hours. We put the bid in at one o'clock. And how long have you known? Oh, three months. Thank you very much. So that wasn't untypical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and a quick search online discovered that underneath the property were two petrol tanks that had been decommissioned but were still there. So fed that back, and I think we got £100,000 off the purchase price because the tanks needed to be decommissioned. Yeah. So by then, people were starting to notice that what we did in terms of sustainability was actually saving them money, which for a lot of them was the driver. Uh, and I'd never really thought about environment and sustainability before, but it suddenly sort of just started to take over my life and started to think about it in everything we did, not just at work, but at home life as well. Yeah. Uh, and I suppose it became my passion for the next 25, 30 years until I retired in April of this year. I'm still active. I still do it for my football club. So I'm the sustainability lead there. I've recently joined a charity. I think you, they're more properly known as something like a community interest company where they're looking to develop a sustainability hub for in, in a region. And I've joined the board there on a voluntary basis. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do work with the Energy Institute still. So if you're looking to become a member or become chartered, it's very likely that I could be the person that does your uh, online interview before you get passed through. So so I keep my hand in and I'm still really interested in what we do. But obviously, at the moment, uh, I don't have a full time job anymore. What was the um, what was your involvement with the energy consciousness, the, the that program? Have you been involved with that program? Like a lot of people, I thought when I did my degree, that was the end of my learning for my life. I could just go out and earn money. 
what a stupid idea that was. So as I've already <laughs> said, I got sent on two other degree courses. I did the BMS controller training with uh, Dan in Horsham uh, and loads of other courses. And even two years ago, when I knew I'd be retiring soon, uh, the idea of the energy conscious organization consultant and practitioner came up. Yeah, yeah. And that's something that really interested me because when we were trying to understand when I was at Land Securities, why tenants didn't do some of the energy management initiatives that seemed so logical. We decided it wasn't about engineering and it wasn't about cost. It was psychology to right. the extent that we even worked with the university to try and develop with their psychology department how we could get energy management higher up the agenda. Yeah. So the Energy Conscious Organisation program uh, seemed to me to be exactly what I've wanted to do for 20 or 30 years, which is about how do you change behaviours, how do you change uh, a culture, how do you make people more aware and realise that actually there's loads of savings out there that don't require you to uh, mortgage yourself to the hilt to do them. It's yeah. actually about behaving sensibly. Uh, so I did that, um, did a project at work where we um, got through and they went up to the, the gold standard on the on the NCU uh, on the energy conscious organization matrix uh but actually my, my initial project that I submitted was one we did with Landsec years ago uh, it was for something called the European energy trophy and we put in a building uh where we worked with the tenants and with the cleaners and with the maintenance company and all we spent was 50 quid on t-shirts with a little logo on them and the logo was designed in-house so that didn't cost us anything right and that reduced the carbon emissions of that building by 29 percent it reduced the energy bill by forty thousand pounds a year and bearing in mind that's 20 20 years ago that's yeah, yeah. probably now i will owe well over a hundred thousand pounds a year yeah, yeah, yeah. well over a hundred thousand pounds a year yeah so really well worth doing and was it was a great project so that's uh why i went on the energy conscious uh, organization uh consultant i'm now a practitioner uh did it with a couple of organizations did it with a hospital uh and uh, one of our clients uh and yeah i think that's that's the way forward as i'm sure we'll talk about as this conversation progresses i, th I think it's overlooked well um so if he was to go and start it all over again wind us back to 30 years ago what would you do different then? Would 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 you have done, carried out the same process, or is there stuff you've learned today, like energy consciousness for a start? We put a lot of we can put a lot of focus and get a lot of benefits. Where what would you start again? Uh, I think I'd go back and use a message that I've had been using for many years, but I wasn't using at the start. Is that when you're looking at a project, or you've got a new contract starting, don't look at it through the microscope. Look at it through an inverted telescope. Right. So the bigger the angle you're looking at something for, you can factor in all the different externalities, particularly the environmental externalities, mm -hmm. and att attack them in the appropriate way right from the outset. Not bolt-ons once you build the building. I have plenty of cases where Landsec designed a building. And I'm sure it applied to every other developer as well. And the energy yeah. manager then gets told, how do we make this more efficient? When is it open? Next week. Actually, you need to ask me that three years ago. Yeah. So if you factor everything in up front, and what I told one of our directors at the last company I was at, so one of our divisions was winning a lot of business, earning a lot of money, but losing a million pound a year. And a new managing director came in and he was tasked with making it profitable again. And so he spoke to me, introduced to me, and we talked about environment. He said, well, how does that relate to me? And I said exactly this. Look through it for an inverted telescope. If you do the right things environmentally, I guarantee you, because I've never been involved with a project where it's not been true, that you will end up with a better project. You will end up with fewer environmental impacts and you'll save money. Yeah. He said, well, I'm going for a laugh. Let's try it. So we had a project where we were putting up 120,000 street lighting columns across the county. And it was done in the normal, traditional way. Every morning, our fleet of lorries would turn up at the suppliers depot all wait in turn to get their, their load put on and deliver them to the site they were serving for that day. Uh, so our logistics team liaised with the supplier and came up with a much better idea. Rather than us go to them, they would load up a few lorries. They would come to hubs across the county. We would collect from them there and distribute locally. 
it reduced the fuel bill enormously. And although we had to pay them, obviously, for the extra fuel they were using to come to us, mm. it saved us a quarter of a million pound in diesel fuel bills in year one. Wow. So you can convert that to carbon. So yeah. the environmental savings are enormous. And also life cycle cost well, analysis look, on the whole vehicle as well, possibly. But the vehicles are doing less mileage, which is good. Yeah. But also you've got, which we hadn't factored in, uh, the time the vehicles were, were wasting, waiting in line to be filled up, disappeared. So suddenly we're working more quickly. Right. Which meant we actually finished the project ahead of time. So the client's delighted because mm. we've actually finished the project ahead of schedule. 120,000 shining new columns up two months before we were meant to. So they're delighted, which means we get a good reputation and we save the money. So we save the money. We had a better project with fewer emissions. The client was happy and it boosted the business. So win, win, win. After yeah. that, he said, all right, can we do that elsewhere? It wasn't always the same project, but can we look at environment on all the projects? And we could. Yeah. So what I would do differently if I was going back to 1986, uh, 87, is factor that in mm. and say to people, actually, we need to look at everything in the round. It's not just about how do we turn the boiler off 10 minutes earlier? It's not about do we run it at 20 degrees circulation instead of 20.5. It's about the whole problem. What can we do? For, do we even need the heat? Do we even, why are we heating the building in June? And mm. I've seen plenty of buildings, I'm sure you have, that the heat comes on in June and on a nice sunny day. Yeah. Let's look at it. Let's, because when companies then say, oh, we'd like to invest £10,000 or whatever it is, £100,000 in a new boiler, a new chlorophyll, but we haven't got the money, you say to them, yes, but you don't have to. It's not just that. You can look at how you run your building better. Rather than supply the energy in a different way, get to a case where you don't need that energy at all and you're still comfortable. Your process still works. You're still manufacturing because that's the big untapped ground. The industry has moved on enormously since I first went into it in late, late 80s, mid 80s. But there are so many companies that are still doing nothing. The ones that have made the biggest strides are probably the same ones that were the leaders then and have yeah. moved on and have kept up with the innovation. And so many companies don't because they think it's difficult. Mm -hmm. I worked in a sector just before I retired where we were supporting uh, public sector organisations, whether that's in the health sector or education or whatever. And they've got really tight targets from government to reduce carbon. And quite often even if they know what to do, they're not doing it because they haven't got the upfront capital. And we're saying, actually, you're looking at it the wrong way. It's not about that project. It's about how do you operate the entire facility? How do you operate the entire service that you're delivering? Can we change the way we do that so you don't need to be so energy intensive? And then that money you save possibly can be ring fenced and plowed back into replacing the chiller. Yeah. And then you do get the long term savings, plus the fact by doing it the right way in the first time, those savings are there forever. Yeah. And I think more of that might have accelerated the way in which and I'm talking, I'm focusing on the built environment sector because that's where I've worked for a long time. Yeah. I think it might have accelerated the change because we still see so many buildings that are badly managed, that are set at the wrong temperatures, that run at the wrong times, that respond to uh problems in the wrong way oh the tenants are cold we'll turn the heating up whereas the first question should be why are they cold yeah because the building wasn't designed for them to be cold so why are they cold don't just turn the heating up work out try and work out why yeah. uh, it's not quite the same but i'll give you an example we were servicing a warehouse type facility and they were going through quite a lot of diesel and we couldn't work out why. So my colleague went over there and did a survey. And he basically did an uh, audit from start to finish, cradle to grave. So when the uh, the lorry turned up, the, the, the delivery van with the diesel, connected up properly. So there was no leak. No, it went in, fine. So where does the diesel delivery go? Oh, it's pumped around this pipe that goes around the building to the tank that's at the back of the building. Okay, so he wanted it down. Halfway around the building, there was a big black stain on the ground because the pipe had a dirty great hole in it. So for every 10,000 litres of diesel they had, 2,000 litres were going straight into the ground. A, an environmental problem, but B, they're paying for it. Yeah. And people just focus on how do we how do we use less diesel? Well, why are you using so much in the first place? What's, yeah. 
reasons. It might not be as straightforward as you think. Uh, so I think that's that's the takeaway I take back is be more holistic. Yeah. You mentioned um, uh, earlier, you, you mentioned it a couple of times, football club. Yeah. Have you... Can you tell us who the club is? Are you... The club Sutton United. So normally a non-league club. We had three years in the Football League. Uh, I'm delighted to say that at that time I was chairman of the board of directors. Really? So saw us get into the Football League, saw us get into Wembley uh, in the uh, Papa John's Trophy final. Uh, but I'd been chairman of the board for 10 years. So I'd, I'd already said when I took on the job, that I wouldn't do it for more than 10. So at the end of that first season in the Football League, I stepped down from the board and as a director because that had been a, quite a stressful year. But one of the things I introduced when I was chairman of the board was sustainability as a as a board agenda item. Yeah. And when I stepped down, I was asked to carry on with that. So like most small football clubs, like most SMEs, in fact, it doesn't have to be football. As I've said, you know, money is tight, but there are things you can do. So whenever we did a refurbishment, we made sure we factored sustainability in. So when the windows needed changing, we went from single to double glazing. Well, we needed to look at the heating. We've worked with one of our sponsors to put in heat pumps to the extent we were able to take out one of our gas boilers. When we changed the floodlights, we went LED. Right. Uh, all that sort of thing can actually start to build up and make a difference. We're now part of a scheme run by uh, the London Borough of Sutton for its businesses to go green. If you engage with their programme, uh, they support you in turn uh, and with a rates rebate, which is great. Uh, and we've gone through that with flying colours. Uh, we've put an EMS in place. We've put an energy management system in place. I report to the board on a monthly basis what we're doing in terms of energy. Uh, I normalise that. We produce a report in which I not only quantify our scope one and two emissions, but all our scope three. So all our travel, but also because I think people overlook this. Football clubs seem to overlook it. The biggest impact is the travel of the spectators. It's not yeah. the 11 players and the substitutes going to the game. It's yeah. the 5,000 supporters that have travelled across the country. That's yeah. the big travel impact. So I've tried to quantify that as well. Like all scope three, I know the numbers aren't right, but that's not the point. It's, it's indicative, it's isn't it? Out. It's indicative, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. too many people get bogged down even now with saying, we can't do scope three because we don't know it accurately. That's not the point. No. Because if you can, if you know where it is and you can encourage all your supply chain to work towards it, it means them tackling their scope one and scope two. And let's yeah. be honest, if everybody's scope one and scope two was zero, nobody has any scope three. Yeah. And that's the point that sometimes people miss. I always think as well, it, we, we need to start. The, each year we do it, it should start to get more accurate. So when we've done ESOS phase one, phase one was probably the step step into the dark. Phase two, we got more clarity. Phase three, we're getting even further clarity. And I'd like to think that now we've got, well, now they've introduced action plans. So we should be using that phase one and two we didn't do nothing but phase yeah. three we now we've got enough evidence now to drive that forward haven't we i think we have and again that's another thing that's disappointing and along with several other people from the property sector and the building services sector met with various government working groups back in the early 90s mid 90s and we were saying to them then if you really want to make a difference make reporting mandatory yeah because no big company is want to put out a report where its energy performance keeps getting worse because yeah. the investors will start going, if you can't do that, how do we know you're managing our money properly? Exactly. And I thought that was a really simple, cheap way to motivate companies to do better. Mm. And also the other trick I think they missed was if you want to promote LEDs. Now, obviously now it, they become effectively mandatory. The but in the days money. when they were still, uh, you know, hot off the drawing board. If you want to promote them, the BBC to put a storyline in East Enders for them to make the Queen Vic all LED right. or the Rose Return in Coronation Street yeah, because yeah. people are like sheep. If they see that happen, they'll go and do it. Yeah, and you've yeah, done it for, almost for free, mm -hmm. and your people are missing a trick. Ah, oh, and the, the, we were just—it was a dismissed idea. Mm. But you can see now with the way the TV programs, when they put a storyline on, they go, "If this issue has affected you at home, please call our helpline." Well, why couldn't that have been energy as well? Yeah. And maybe get key people to be driving an EV car. Exactly. Like yes. Having having the problem about plugging in an EV. There's all those little stories. Going, oh, yeah. I see what exactly. you're going, where you're going. It's, I think it's very good. You, you could. I mean, at the football club, one of the things that we say, why do we do it at the football club? Is they're at the hub of their community. Yeah. 
for example, we, with nutrition, uh, one of the things we do, our footballers go into the schools and they talk to the pupils about eating well and exercise. Yeah, yeah. Because they'll listen to the local footballer. Of course they will. They're not going to listen to their teacher telling them or some doctor has shipped in for the day. I don't care. They're going to be flicking paper pellets at each other. Yeah. The centre forward comes in who's got a hat trick last week. I'll oh, listen to him. Who's branded. Who's branded as well. Branded as well. So the football club can get things done that isn't, possible necessarily by yeah. traditional routes and that's you know even more true if you're man united or liverpool uh yeah. and that's giving and back to the community club. isn't it it is it's about you are football clubs are, and, and not just football cricket clubs and you know yeah. you are but football is obviously such the high profile sport that they have such a big influence on people if football clubs went over for example like forest green rovers have to to kits that don't include any artificial fibers yeah all natural then people will go Oh, okay, and some would start to go down that as well. There's not enough played on them stories. I don't. No, think. I don't think there is. No, I. I and I'm as you say before, we we are missing a trick. There's a there's a, and it, it's a. Uh, John Mulholland comes up with this. I forget now what the word is, but I always call it bend it like Beckham. So basically, let's kick the ball out to the corner flag, for it to come back and hit the goal. And that's yes. what we need to be doing, isn't it? We need to be sending the message out that way to then come back in. Forget now what the word is. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter. Well, yeah, you, <laughs> we can yeah, cut that bit. Right. <laughs> so the, the, you do. It's the more and more people can get involved, then I think that has to be beneficial. Now, the company I've just uh, retired from, we've been hearing it for a long time that young people are motivated by environments and they like to work for companies that take it seriously. Certainly where I was working, that was very, very true. And the company had a really good graduate program. Uh, and when the graduates came in, they were given six months in each of six different disciplines across the company. It could be finance, it could be project management, it might be sustainability. And unlike a lot of companies where the graduate gets told to do the photocopying, they were told, here's a project, get on with it. And people either sunk or swam. And yeah. to be honest, 90% did really, really well. Yeah. And I would say that most of the change that I've seen happen in that company over the five last five years has been driven not by the directors, but by the graduates. Yeah, yeah. They nearly all wanted a placement in the sustainability team. Uh, we had some superb graduates in that team. And they took those messages out into the company. And if they were working, let's say, on a hospital, they'd say, well, that's not the sustainable way. We should be doing it this way. And they started to make things happen. And I think that sort of... I mean, you can call it evangelism if you want, but it's not. It's common sense. Yeah. It can make the difference. When people go, why should I do it? Because the Chinese are, the Americans are. So there's one planet where one people, we've all got to do it. Mm. And gradually, as more and more people do it, they'll get to the stage where actually most people are doing it. Yeah. When you first took that job on the environmental side, it's well ahead of the curve, wasn't it? You said yours one of the yeah. first. What was going through your mind? Because you couldn't follow anyone. You couldn't no, it's interesting. Book, I could tell people. We had what's a blank sheet of paper. Yeah. And I didn't know where to start. So we, we engaged with a consultancy. March Consulting came in to help us. They've long gone, merged with other companies many times. Yeah. And they said, well, we can write you a policy. That's easy because every policy looks like every other. Take, yeah. take Rolls Royce's policy and put your name on it or take Barclays Bank. They're all the same. The yeah, policy yeah. is not the question. The question is the detail you put after it. So we wrote a policy and I said to the director, the worst thing we can do is publish a policy and not have a program to support it because we'll look even worse. Yeah. We now have to do things. Yeah. So we started to set targets. We started to put to talk about putting in place an EMS and the company was nervous at first about that. Why do we want 14,001? Nobody else is doing it. Our customers aren't asking for it. Aren't we just setting ourselves up to be shot at? Mm. Uh, but fortunately, we had uh, a really progressive CEO who agreed to do it all to the extent that when we produced our first environment report, the MD of the, one of the other big three property companies phoned me up and said, hello, dear boy, I've just seen your report. Why are you doing that? So I explained and he said, oh, but you've done it all on your own. Don't you think you should share it all with us in the first place? So I said, I better refer you to the CEO. And the CEO said, we spent all that time and money getting to this point. Why on earth would I tell him what we've done? So we've now got a mover advantage. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. Rivardi persisted for two or three years. And then obviously, you know, great things being done by British Land, by Hammerson, by Grosvenor. Uh, you know, loads of really good work. The uh, UK Green Building Council, uh, the Better Buildings Partnership. And interestingly, all those people, we all knew each other. Yeah, yeah. We all sat down, whether it's a central London energy management group, whether it's at a UK GBC meeting, whether it was at a better buildings partner, we still knew each other. And actually, we still all know each other now. We're all connected by LinkedIn still, or we go to meetings and they're there and we say, hello, Julie, how are you? I haven't seen you for five years, but, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the conversations carry on. Yeah. So it's, it's really interesting. And in a way, I miss being out of it by, by uh, not working. On the other hand, I quite like being out of my dogs. Yes. And you sound like you're keeping very busy as well. I think, yeah, I think I've got eight volunteer roles at the moment. Uh, four of them at the football club and four elsewhere. Uh, I'm probably looking for more. I hate being inactive. Yeah, yeah. But I think, and this isn't meant to sound big-headed, I think I've been doing this for long enough to actually have some information that's worth giving back to other people. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the reasons this podcast is going out there, to share that knowledge and the experience, you know, your our 30 years experience is going to get back into someone's mind you know and we only have to trigger something small oh yeah. i should be doing that or i could be doing that and it's the passion coming from us back to them you know that will lead us how many buildings were you talking about with the portfolio we would were, we're talking significant amounts weren't we so when i was at land securities as you probably know they owned most of victoria street and half the city of london right so there was about 50 office buildings that we were managing energy for. And there were about 50 shopping centers or retail parks up and down the country. So about a hundred buildings. Yeah. The monthly energy bill back then was about a quarter of a million pounds. I suppose you put that forward to now, that would be about four or 5 million a month. So uh, quite significant. Yeah. We weren't as big as some of the steel companies or people like that who have obscene amounts of energy being used, but we were, we were an important user. Uh, and then as we turn that to environment rather than just energy, we were able to go out, work with all the shopping centre managers, all the, the building managers about how we put in place 14,001, how we then communicate that to the tenants about how it's a service we're providing at no extra cost to them, but actually it's giving them a better building, a more comfortable building, and we're reducing the running costs. Yeah, uh, That's a good selling point because people – sometimes still get confused about sustainability it's not just about the environment the, the social aspect bit and the business bit you want to be in business tomorrow and you want your clients to be in business tomorrow it's still important you know, it's not yeah. it's not obscene to talk about money as part of sustainability and you mentioned iso 14001 but in in latter times 50001 iso 50001 yeah, so, is that on the radar yeah, I've lost count of the number of 50,001 systems I've written. It's probably about four or five. Right. Uh, yeah, very similar, of course. I mean, that's the one the advantage of the ISO process is that the systems are designed to, to mirror each other in the way yeah. they're written. So you can follow the same logic. You've obviously got to write slightly different processes and slightly different targets or whatever. But that's been uh, very successful, and I think it works. I think it does focus people's attention on um, gathering data and not making assumptions and looking at the data. Um, it takes me back to one of the first bits of, I said, you know, I thought I'd stop learning when I did my degree, but one of the first courses I got sent on was a guy called Peter Harris. I don't know if you remember him from Cheriton Technology. And I always think of him as the guru of degree days. Right. He could use degree days to an extent I've never seen anybody else. And he could be sent a building's energy profile for the last year without ever going there, he'd be able to go back and say, right, this is your problem. And it dates back to the 3rd of June last year when it looks to me like you disabled one of your gas boilers. And he could interpret the data so accurately. It was almost like uh, magic. It was yeah, really yeah. very, very clever. Protocols being written by the likes of Trend, by the likes of Honeywell, by the likes of Schlumberger, where you could monitor loads of data points, get the information out. But people needed to be able to analyse it. Yeah. One of the things we did was the technology got too far ahead of the people who were using it. So I can remember buildings where we had great systems in that put all this information out and it so blinded the poor engineer in the building yeah, that he would run the building in hand because he didn't understand all of the yeah. controls. Consider, consider wood for the trees, basically. Couldn't say the wood too for much. the trees. Yeah. yeah. And we looked at buildings where the, the air conditioning would come on at three in the morning. 
because and we go we can't understand why that's not the signal that's coming out the bms until you finally you, you sit in there and you realize what's happening literally someone sat in the building overnight and realized the system was coming on because the engineer put it in hand yeah because he didn't understand the information he was being given exactly. and so nowadays i think the engineers get a better level of training to, to run these buildings but when they first came out bms's were being put in and they deserve the epithet they got the most expensive time clocks in the world yeah because they exactly. weren't being used properly no it's ironic now because we can get our, our hands on all sorts of data can't we through the internet like degree data degree day data from all over the world it's amazing what data we can yeah and of course the apps are on apps are on mobile phones yeah i, I knew of people who were dialing into their building from a beach on holiday yeah. and saying oh uh heating's on today don't know why the heating and we'll turn the heating off remotely from from holiday yeah. because it shouldn't have been on in the middle of july yeah so david this has been uh it's really one great catching up with you and hearing this these stories um and i remember fighting for your business when i was with trend and when i was with satchel it was crazy times for me because obviously the land security portfolio was always there to be sort of worked with and you was very sort of a key member there um so it's come to that time and you've already alluded to some of this stuff. Is there anything that you can give back to our industry today as a takeaway? I and mean, I know you've been touching on some of this stuff already. Yeah. And I think so to repeat what I said earlier, partly it's about making sure that knowledge, not just me, but anybody that gets to sort of my stage of their career, the knowledge they've learnt gets passed back and obviously it'll be adapted and used differently. But I think it's important not to use that, lose that resource. But I think from a personal point of view, I think, it's very much about you don't have to spend lots of money. The the cultural awareness and behavioural change ideas can make a massive difference. I mean, we did, uh, I don't want to call them experiments, we did surveys. So one of them surveyed 100 buildings, one surveyed 3,000 buildings when we had a, 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 in a different company. And the average saving without spending any money just from better management was 18%. Wow. So people glibly say, oh, you'll save 10%. You can do better than that. Yeah. You can save 18 And as I mentioned earlier, one of our buildings saved 29%. Yeah. So that's there. Why wouldn't you take it? I don't understand people that say it's too complicated. Every bit of energy you save is energy that doesn't have to be generated. It's carbon that's not emitted. It's good for your public image. It's good for your carbon reporting. But most of all, it's energy you don't have to buy, so that's profit straight onto your bottom line. Yeah. How many widgets do you have to sell to make £100? Exactly. You can save that easily every day on your energy bill just by being smarter. Yeah. I think that's the key thing. If everybody did that, we could probably reduce the energy demand of the country by, I don't know, 25 30 40%. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about saving 50% of carbon, that's a massive part of it. And we're overlooking it and we're still overlooking it. And I find yeah. that so frustrating. There's the frustrating thing. Uh, we was in a building yesterday um, and they've implemented LEDs and they've got controls, but we was looking at it and thinking they can go and they made say 25% saving on what they did. But we was looking at it yesterday from a different view to reduce it even further. You know, they can improve the controls, remove, it was it was lighting leds so we was looking at all these lights we could probably reduce that lighting again because mm -hmm. we was in it wasn't an office area but they had lighting equivalent to the office area they didn't need that light no one was no. sitting there working no exactly i so went to take a, that next step again you can i went to a, a fairly new hospital and they were telling me really proudly about the leds they put all around the atrium i said it's great but you've got, got a glass roof atrium they don't need to be on. You're getting 10,000 laps coming through the roof. Yeah. Leave them for when it's dark. You don't need them on all the time. Yeah. And they say, oh, uh, but it looks nice. Yeah. But it looks nice <laughs> in sunlight as well. Yeah, exactly. Well, Dave, thank you very much. It's been great to catch up with you. I wish your team some the best of uh, luck in the, the season now. Are they doing all right? Are you happy where they are? We're doing okay. We've got a very young side, but we've got a big game on Saturday, on Sunday. We're live on television. It's the first round of the FA Cup, and we're hosting Birmingham City. Oh, so wow. it'll be a full house and uh, a chance for an upset, hopefully. Brilliant. Well, my, my best friend supports Birmingham. I'll be winding <laughs> him up later. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have a hard game at the weekend. It will be very difficult, yes. No, no, he will have a hard game. Oh, yeah, Against yes. you, the underdogs. Hopefully. hopefully. 
Brilliant. Well, look, David, thank you very much. I would like to say uh, you and your family stay safe in these times. And you. Thank you very much for having me on. Been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you to my guest for joining me on Energy Speaks Back. I hope you found today's insights valuable. And don't forget, please listen to the previous episodes because they're full of insights to help you make a real impact on energy efficiency. Together we can drive change and make a difference to the environment and our planet. So thank you. Once again, that leaves me with one more thing to say. Please, you and your family, stay safe in these times.